I was uh, born in Pakistan, grew up in Abu Dhabi, and at the age of 16, my mom came into my room and told me that there's a marriage proposal for you, and you're going to be going away to this faraway country called Canada. Uh, and the marriage proposal was for a man who was 11 years older than me and who was the sister of my mom's, uh, sorry, the brother of my mom's um, friend. So a few months later, at just after my 17th birthday, I was sitting in a big grand banquet hall, decked up in red and gold, beside the stranger who was now my husband. And a few months after that, I arrived in Canada with a lot of hopes and dreams that I'll be able to go to school because that was what was promised. Uh, but then I was told that now that I'm someone's wife and daughter-in-law and soon to be a mom, uh, my job is to stay home and protect the family honor and keep the family intact. And any, any education dreams or hopes or whatever I had were termed as useless hobbies. Um, in fact, I was told that I should be grateful that I got to the real purpose of being a woman sooner rather than later and didn't have to go through all of that education crap. So I spent many years uh, trying to fit into that box of acceptance, uh, you know, diminishing my own self and my voice and my thoughts and my ambitions and trying to figure out how to be a good wife and a good mom and a good daughter-in-law and a good woman. And, you know, trying to tell myself that every time bruises appeared on my body or I was told bad things about myself, it was my fault. But somehow this voice in my head kept saying, no, it doesn't seem right. It doesn't feel right. It, you know, maybe I do deserve better. And uh, one thing I couldn't give up on was my right to an education. So I completed my high school courses through distance learning at home uh, because I wasn't allowed to go to a regular high school. In fact, I wasn't allowed to go anywhere outside of the house. And then I started university um, after 10 years of marriage and two children. And at that time, um, I was 26. And uh, I had saved money uh, for my university through child, uh, providing babysitting services at home because I wasn't allowed to go out and get a job. And I couldn't get OSAP because his income was too high. So anyway, I started university. And that's when my world started opening. And I was doing really well in class, and I was pulling straight A's, but the most important thing that happened was that I was actually connecting with people. And my friends would, you know, knew, my classmates would come and say, hey, you want to grab a cup of coffee? You want to go and grab chicken wings tomorrow? Or you want to study together? And in my head, I was like, why are these people talking to me? Like, I'm this scum stuck at the bottom of someone's shoe. I'm, I'm, no, I'm good for nothing. That's what I'm told every day. So, why am I getting all this attention and kindness? And then I would go home and be treated like crap. And I was just wondering, who am I? So one day, as I was walking on campus, going to the bookstore, and I stumbled upon a sign that's had a bunch of questions on it. Do you feel intimidated? Like you've lost your voice, like you're living in fear. And I'm just standing there answering yes to all of those questions. And then I go in and make an appointment. And up until then, whoever I talked to had told me that it was my fault and I need to do better to be a good wife, to be a good mom and all of those. And, and this was the first time where somebody said to me, uh, my, that counselor that I talked to, Samra, it's not your fault. No matter what you do, you do not deserve to be abused or treated this way. No one does. So that started a journey of self-discovery, going to counseling, learning about myself, my rights as a woman, my own, developing my voice, my confidence, uh, and you know, still a lot of back and forth, dealing with all the cultural backlash and the fears and anxiety and all that. But eventually, um, I was uh, I did leave, and the biggest factor for me was realizing that I don't want my daughters to grow up thinking that this was normal. So um, I put myself through university while raising my kids as a single mom and working multiple jobs. Graduated as a top student at U of T. I won a lot of awards and scholarships, did my master's, and I got more success than I ever could have imagined. There was also this big question and hunger and like this, this burning passion inside of me that I'm not the only one this happens to. Like, I, need, I wanted to do something, and I just, like, there's a purpose why all of this happened. It, you know, why did I go through all of that and then come out with, with you know, with the success, like, like yeah, I'm hardworking and, and smart and all of those things may be true, but uh, most people are, a lot of people, like most people are in their own ways, I believe that. And so the difference was that, you know, the five times that I'd gone back before and the 
The fact that I didn't go back that sixth time when I left was because of the community and the support that I had around me at U of T. Because I was a student there, I was living there on campus, and that's eventually what enabled me to build my own resilience. And I realized that I could never pay it back, but I can pay it forward. And that's really what motivated me to start sharing my story to help others. Like maybe I'll, you know, I would, I would start speaking at little community events here and there. And it was like, you know, maybe there's just one woman in the audience who can hear it and say, I can do it too. And that's it. Like it was all on my own time, my own cost. Like, and people would like, why, why are you doing this? Like, are you crazy? You built your life. You have a great job. Like just go live your life. And I'm like, no, but what about all those other people? <laughs> and, and just, it's, it's really organically evolved from there. And, uh, uh, and then I wrote a little piece in, in, a, in a magazine. Uh, actually, somebody wrote about me, and then Toronto Life picked that up. And then they called me, and they said, hey, would you like to do a full feature memoir? And like, yeah, of course. <laughs> and, and I struggled with a lot of uh, you know, that fear of vulnerability, too. I mean, I was at that time working at RBC, and uh, you know, biggest bank in Canada, and very corporate environment. How are people going to see me? You know, am I, going to be seen as a sob story, as somebody who's just wanting attention, or would it be termed as a cultural story? And, but I've often like, been, like all the time, been so humbled and, and welcomed. And I realized that that is really the key to building authentic connections, is when you really allow yourself to be seen. And that's when you can build resilience within yourself and others around you. And, um, the messages that I receive every day on social media keep me going. Uh, that's the purpose, uh, to help change lives. And um, two months ago, I was speaking at uh, a conference at U of T. And as I got off stage, uh, a, a woman, a PhD student, she came up to me and hugged me and said, I'm not staying for the rest of the conference. I'm leaving right now because I'm going to the police station to report my abuser. Thank you for giving me the courage to stand up for myself. And, and then she wrote to me three days later and told me that she did that and she, how liberated she felt. Um, two years ago when I, wrote, when I published that article in Toronto Life, a man from Pakistan, the same town I was, I was born in, wrote and said, I have a 17-year-old daughter. Her wedding is fixed for next month. I just read your story and I've canceled the wedding and I'm deciding to send her to school.